On a Cold Day by Himani Banerjee, Part 2. Debbie Barton, or Devika Barton, as she was once called in her native Calcutta, was on her way to the office. It was about nine o'clock in the morning, very bitterly cold, and she was a little late. As she stepped out of the warm of the subway station, Debbie felt the cold hit her in the face like a fist. She was a little breathless from its impact at first, but picked up speed soon enough, drawing the collar of her coat tightly against her throat. Her eyes went instinctively to the huge glass panes of the clothing store she passed, and there, in one shop window, sprawled between two mannequins, white and blonde, their breasts and crotches thrust out, she saw herself in a flowered nightdress, sprawled on the sidewalk. This pulled her up short, and she wheeled around to view the body of Azima on the sidewalk. Horrified and fascinated at the same time, she slowly walked towards the body. And as she looked at Azima more closely, this uncanny feeling of resemblance gave way to the relief as the feeling of seeing herself reflected in a mirror made room for the recognition of difference. A woman from either India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or for that matter from Trinidad or Guyana or Africa or Fiji from just about anywhere in the world of South Asian origin as the new newspaper said lay in front of her dead and cold. Yet in that face neither young nor old she saw something of herself and even some of her friends. Standing a few feet away from the body, among a gradually increasing cir circle of passers-by, she searched the fragile face in front of her for clues. What, she wondered, could drive her to do this? To die like this, she thought, in this cold country, coming all the way to here to die. The brown face in front of her, the wisps of hair on the face, the gold earrings glistening in the sun, she looked searchingly at each item. Suddenly she felt the impulse to touch the woman lying on the ground, to sit next to her and cradle her head on her lap, to make a coat from the shop window to cover her from the cold. To take a coat from the shop window to cover her from the cold. She felt herself go colder when she noticed the purple tinge settling into Azima's lips and cheeks, the brown of, her ex of the extended arm taking on a gray and the stiffness of hard wood. A woman from my own country, she thought. Doesn't she have anyone? Why is no one looking for her? A husband, a child, a relative? What is her name? Who is she? The woman lying before her could give no answer. But even though she gave no direct answers as to her personal identity, the dead woman sent forth a wave of images to Debbie. Her sheer presence on the sidewalk, her black hair and brown Indian face, her feet lightly calloused at the heels, all riveting and obstructing the traffic as though a mango tree in bloom or a palm tree had suddenly sprung up in the middle of this cold concrete. Busy streets of her own city, its warmth, smells, dust and colors overwhelmed Debbie Barton who now saw herself as she had been only a few years ago, in a starched sari, a braid down her back, carrying her sister's automatic, automatic umbrella, waiting at the end of the road near her parents' house for a cycle rickshaw to show up. To show up. It was uncanny how she could see herself, as though in a mirror, somewhere else, someone else from a long time ago. Devika Bartham, or of Jadavpu had no idea about the permed, made-up, perfumed Debbie, who changed her name because a counselor had advised her to, as one of the stocks in trade for finding a job. Debbie Barton, said the counselor, whose surface was as shiny as new nail polish. It's a neat, easy, nice name. Every employer wants to be able to pronounce their employees' names without going to heritage language classes. Debbie thought that was a good idea, too. It certainly saved her having to coach people or wince every time they mispronounced her name. She had learned the phrase, can't complain. She said, can't complain. 
She had been working at the cash in a nearby clothing store. She was young, attractive, and adaptable. There was a future for her here. Her mind again drifted to the woman in front of her. She lay like a question mark before her. Debbie had a frantic desire to know her history, at least her name, and of course, who pushed her out into the street from such a high place, from the safety of her home. A husband, she thought, maybe he pushed her, or maybe he just left her alone in this big city, without a penny, without a future or past. So she was fed up and just jumped. And yet, there was the silence, and of course Debbie would never really know, except may maybe tomorrow a little news item would appear in the paper. But in the middle of the silent space that lay in the cold air between Debbie Barton and the dead woman on the stark gray pavement, the police arrived, their lights flashing, their sirens hooting, their neat blue and black outfits matching the cold air in precision and trimness. Backing off many steps to their curtly ejected order, Debbie saw how healthy and pink these officers of law looked, and how, like deaf and blind men, neither seeing nor hearing, with pairs of black-gloved hands, they moved various props around, onto which, with the help of the ambulance men, they placed the cold, stiff remains of the brown woman. <laughs> yeah, more. As they lifted the stretcher, Debbie's hands went up to her forehead. Palms joined in a gesture of both homage and prayer. Mr. Abdul Jalal, whose hands were also uplifted, noticed this gesture. Quietly, he moved over to her. They were almost at the door of his grocery and take out coffee and snacks store. Fixing Debbie with his grave eyes, he asked, You know her? Your countrywoman, maybe? No, I don't know her, said Debbie. But yes, she's from my country. Though the crowd was dispersing now, Debbie stood there, unable to move in any direction. The cold was biting into her bone, beating into her bones again. Something she had noticed in the last while. She felt dazed. The idea of right away walking into her workplace quite unnerved her. Where could she go? So, without thinking, she turned around and followed Mr. Abdul Jalal into his store. As she sat in a chair at one or of two small tables stuck away between two shelves of canned goods, she was still cold and huddled into her coat. Her hands and feet tingled, as if stimulated by little electric shocks. The big toe of her left foot also hurt somewhat, a symptom she had developed for forcing her feet into closed high-heeled shoes, without which they would not hire her, it seemed. A coffee, please, she said to Mr. Jalal, who had retreated behind his counter now and was carefully putting away his outer garments under it. The store was small. It sold dry goods of Middle Eastern variety, odds and, odds and ends such as brass balls and, car and scarves and coffee and sweets for takeout. Mr. Abdul Jalal brought her a coffee, pulled up a chair near her table and sat down. It seemed as if they had attended a funeral together and had now achieved a state of courteous, courteous intimacy. Why do you think she did it? He asked her, as if she had been a sister of the deceased. I don't know, said Debbie. Perhaps she wasn't happy. Perhaps someone pushed her. Who? asked, asked, asked Mr. Jalal. Her husband, maybe. Maybe, said Debbie, rather absent-mindedly. She neither felt obliged to talk nor felt it necessary to avoid his probing. She was just comfortable with this talkativeness and curiosity about others' affairs. It made her feel she existed and that the two of them were real persons together. How different, she thought, and she recalled the morning as it had passed before she saw the dead woman. It was past seven when she had got up, made herself tea, ate some cereal with a bowl of milk, stared at a set of clothes with which, which felt not like her own, but a set of costumes or dis disguises. She sat in her kitchen for a while, working herself up to get dressed, to put on her makeup, which made her dark brown skin look rather a sham, and to go to work. She had to develop the right motivation and the right attitudes, she thought, as she applied a little cover-up rouge to her cheeks. She should probably get a diploma in one of the community colleges. 
while leaving her apartment. One more time, she noticed the peeling wall at the top of the radiator, he heard the hiss and sputter, and dreaded the cold she would encounter as she bent down to zip her boots. On her way down, she looked in vain for a letter from home. Once on the street, she again had this peculiar feeling of unreality, as though she was somewhere where she had no business being, or knew exactly how she got there. Nor knew exactly how she got there. At the subway station, she waited humbly, deferentially, at the end of the line. She was going to ask a question today, which she had rehearsed in her mind. She shunned any such exercise normally, since the answers came grudgingly and curtly, with her having the courage, without her having the courage to get any detail. She got a feeling that she was not quite there, a feeling of invisibility, compounded by the fact that a white woman jumped the queue, banging her with a huge shoulder bag, but did not look back once to say sorry. The same woman, however, bumped into a white young woman and hastily said, sorry, real sorry, in a penitent voice, while the young woman said, you just busted, you just butted into the line. A small agitation followed in the line. White people spoke to each other across her head, face, body, as though she were invisible. Slowly, as she stood there struggling to keep herself from completely disappearing, she looked at the white people. They were losing their faces, sacks, and details of clothing and becoming one mass of a cold ice color. This feeling continued with her as she sat in the train, making herself as, mo as small as possible, knees straightened together, hands over them, her handbag not exceeding the boundaries of her lap. Two white people sat on either side of her, and they kept expanding, squeezing her out of the very little space that she took. She looked at the passengers across from her seat, a white young male whose legs were aggressively thrust forward, with knees jutting out, and a white woman sitting comfortably with a magazine, taking just as much room as she needed. Her purple coat, matching scarf and beautifully groomed hair, and shiny skin with a discreet touch of makeup, exuded a confidence that Debbie could never have. At the time of leaving the train, Debbie inadvertently banged into a white man, and even though she said sorry instantly, she heard him mutter something about fucking packies under his breath. Then she had come onto the street and seen herself lying on the pavement, reflected in the shop window. It was a nasty shock, but now, in Mr. Abdul Jalal's store, faced with his questioning, she felt that she was gaining a body and a voice that someone actually heard and saw her. He even had questions for her. What country do you come from? Are you alone here? How long do you live here? Are you married? Why are you alone? A girl should have a husband if she is alone in this country. Back in her own country, if, sh if a shopkeeper asked her these questions, this kind of questions, she would not answer him. She would leave the store with some rude or curt reply. But here it was a different matter. Very soon she had told Mr. Abdul Jalal about her worries regarding her old parents, her brothers and employment, and her own ambitions. He, in his turn, arranging tins of stuffed grape leaves, tahini and ready-made hummus, packets of cardamom and other wares, confided to her his extensive business plans, worries about his relatives in Palestine, his son's misdemeanors. misdemeanors. They talked as do for... They talked as do refugees who find themselves in the same camp. Finally, she asked him for the time. She was indeed very late for work, but decided to go anyway. She didn't want any paid doc for Christmas, when the girls at the office gave, gave each other presents. Though she was not a Christian, she could not stay away because it brought an air of liveliness to their workplace. As she made her way to the door, she turned around to thank Mr. Abdul Jalal, He was still preoccupied with the dead woman. I wish I knew what her name was, so I could offer a prayer, he said. Debbie could never understand what made her lie at this last moment. Actually, she said, actually I knew her. Not well, just met her at the party. I just didn't want to talk about it. Her husband had just left her and taken away their kid. She didn't have a job. Her English wasn't great and she was really down, depressed. Mr. Abdul Jalal 
turned his heavy gaze at her. So, what was her name? he asked. Oh, Davika, Davika Bartham, said Debbie. What kind of name is that? From India, she replied, from a city called Calcutta. Calcutta. I heard of Calcutta, said Mr. Abdul Jalal. A big Muslim community there, too. Okay, he said. I'll offer up a prayer for her when I go to the mosque this evening. Thank you, said Debbie, and stepped out into the street and the cold whiteness of the city.